I'm getting ready to share a message with you guys on man's favorite sport. It is something God put in my heart. He dealt with me about. It's kind of out there on the edge for some folks, but I promise you, if you'll listen to this message from the beginning all the way to the end, you're going to understand the heart of God. And I want to share with you some things that men don't get to say. Some things that are on men's heart and they don't get to talk about. We're going to take a lighthearted look at some very serious things that men deal with and think about but are very unable to communicate. This message will bless you, your family, and give you insight into what's going on. Whether you're male or female, God is going to use this message to help you to understand your place and your purpose in the kingdom of God. And, and I'm going to be a little blunt today, and it's a PG message, and, uh, and uh, most of you gave your kids cell phones, so they already in the X-rated world, because you ain't monitoring them. You just think your little, little Johnny boy is a good boy. The dude is born with the nature of Adam, and the first sin on that phone, he will find it. You give him a computer and a TV, and you lock him in your room, his room, and think he's doing it in there watching Barney and that. No, he not. It's just a wake-up call right out of the gate. I'm just telling you what kind of message I got. And so you just need to grab a hold of it. The message is called Man's Favorite Sport. Man's Favorite Sport. We got UK fans in here. We got football fans. If anybody's ever been in Alabama, you roll tide roll or whatever it is down there they do. And you got all this stuff. You got cars. I was hanging out with the car guys last night. I had a lot of fun doing that. And... Uh, you got hunters and fishermen, and men fill their lives with sport. But before you try to guess what man's favorite sport is, I'm just going to let the cat out of the bag, because one of the sports that is mentioned in the Bible is, you didn't know it, but it's right there in your Bible. And I'm not talking about Paul talking about boxing. That's one sport mentioned in the Bible. I mean, Genesis 26 and verse 6. Isaac and Rebekah has gone down to Egypt. And down in Egypt, let me read it to you. Verse 7. And the men of that place asked him of his wife. He said, she's my sister. For he feared to say, she is my wife. Because the men of that place would kill him for her. Because she was very beautiful. He, he, was, he wasn't in his hometown. They didn't play by his rules. They didn't serve his God. And he married a beautiful wife. And he knew if he took her down there in that city of the heathen, they would have killed him to take home their trophy wife. So he just said, tell him you're my sister. Verse 8. And it came to pass that he had been there a long time. Everybody say a long time. And Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, looked out at a window. And he saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. Now, I ain't got time to fill in the blank, but if you ain't figured it out, King Abimelech didn't have to get a dictionary and say, wait a minute. No, they hugged their sisters. He knew immediately Rebecca was no longer Isaac's sister. Come on, see, I knew y'all get mad and quiet all at the same time. I want to tell you for a few minutes today, men, I'm going to talk to you in a moment. Ladies, I want to give you a challenge and right out of the gate. I'm getting ready to tell you what men want to tell you, and if you leave the building before I get through, you're going to hate my guts. But the way this message God gave it to me, I can't get to the men till the end. So you need to tie a knot in your rope and hold on because I'm going to talk to you the next few minutes in this day and age. And, I, I, you know, this day and age when people don't have morals, they don't know what's right and wrong. And that God spoke to me as a pastor. I'm getting ready to draw the line in the sand on morality and marriage in this church. 
I'm going to draw the line on some doctrines that are false that are going on. And I'm just saying, I want you here at the river to know what we believe. Because there's some crazy stuff going on in our society. So when I share this little story, and there's a great opportunity to go into the details of what happened here. But I want to put a spotlight in what it's like to be a man. To be a man. Men have a hard time understanding that they can be a man and a husband and a father. But men's hardcore nature is just to be a man. That's the reason it takes women to bring their kids to church. Because men don't think that's what men do. But I want to talk to you a moment and get real honest. And then I believe God, by His Holy Spirit, is going to bring it together. So when you begin to look at manhood, and, and, and this thing that Isaac, I'm using for a springboard, that uh, opens a door to a subject that we normally don't talk about. I'm not up here going to get into details, but I'm going to switch quickly to the emotional side of being a man. Every man in this room, we're all in different walks of life. We are going through different things. Some of you may think this does not apply to you. Some may think, well, this is irrelevant. But I got, what I got to share with you today is for every person in this room, because in this day and age of the lack of morality and understanding, a Christian home ought to be the happiest place on planet Earth. And there is absolutely no scriptural reason for it not to be. What happens, I don't understand, but when man and woman is dating, they're trying to make the other one happy. When they get married, they want their wife or their husband to make them happy. Something shifts. And we're in a society that feeds into it. But I want to look at a snapshot that amazes me because there's a manly man in Genesis chapter 29 and verse 11 that was on the hunt for a wife. He was looking for a wife. And you find this guy, his name is Jacob. Jacob was a little different than Esau, his brother, but he was a wise man in the city. He, had, he knew how to think it through, but he went looking for a wife. And when he got to his uh, place where he was looking for a wife, in Genesis 29, 11, it says, And Jacob, when he saw Rachel, fell in love with her immediately, and he kissed her, and he lifted up his voice and wept. <laughs> That's enough where you come out for right there. Y'all let me like, all right. You know what men are looking for? They're looking for an overwhelming fulfillment in a relationship where manhood and all their theories go out the window and a grown man all of a sudden feels so connected with another human being that all rules went out the window and he thought, this is the one for me. He, he grabbed the whole of that. It is an overwhelming, wonderful fulfillment when two people make a spiritual and godly connection and then... That's what men are looking for. That's what women are looking for. A deep connection beyond the natural mind, and we call it falling in love. Because you kissed your mother and you didn't have those feelings. You kissed Aunt Sally and you sure didn't have those feelings. And mama made you kiss your sister because y'all had been fighting, and you went, ew. But you find another individual that moves you to your deepest core. And so Jacob said in those days he couldn't just sweep her off his feet. He had to talk to her dad. Dad says, sure, you can marry my daughter after you served me for seven years. Hello? That would call out most marriages right there. Men don't want to work for nothing. Come on. When you finally find men working out on the parkway, they ha they're so proud they're working, they put a sign up and say, men working. Yeah. They got to advertise they're working. So men don't want to work for nothing. We just want life to be handed to us. Because mama spoiled the socks off of us, and we think everybody's going to do that. 
Come on, women. If you if you train in men, help them grow up. Don't create 35-year-old babies. If they get in trouble, sometimes they need to work it out. Hallelujah. Teacher does something you don't like, shut up and tell your child, you better straighten up. Don't go to school straighten out a teacher because they're trying to get your child to do right. Well, what happened is, in Genesis chapter 29, I want to read this to you. So Jacob spent the next seven years working to pay for Rachel. And his love for her was so strong that it seemed like a few days. See, this is the reason there ain't no marriage. That's the reason people are living in adultery. That's the reason people are living in sin. Because men ain't got to do nothing. They just want the cake and you give them the icing too. And they ain't going to put no ring on your finger. Verse 21. Finally, the time came for him to marry. I have fulfilled my contract, Jacob said to Laban. Now give me my wife so we can be married. So Laban invited everyone in the neighborhood to a celebration with Jacob's wedding feast. And that night, when it was dark, Laban took Leah to Jacob, and he slept with her. And Laban gave Leah a servant named Zephah to be her maid. Now watch this, to show you how stupid men are. 25, verse 25. When Jacob so sobered up in the morning, I mean, when Jacob woke up in the morning, it was Leah. What sort of trick is this? Jacob raised. I worked seven years for Rachel, and you gave me Leah. Now, first of all, I don't have time to go there, but how did he get through his wed night? Without knowing, but that's another story. And y'all ain't mature enough for me to talk to you about that. But here's what happens to men. They fall in love. They got their idea of what marriage is. They're willing to work for it. If a woman will let them, if she's not willing, he'll be a dog. And you train him to be a dog. And don't be surprised when he's a dog after you get married. But in this case, the man wanted to do what's right. He worked hard for his wife. But when he finally married, he thought the one that he kissed and moved him to tears. He woke up in the morning, and it wasn't her. It was his, her sister, Leah. Now, how does that apply in this room? See, men have fantasies of what their wife is going to be like. Most men at some point feel like, I thought I married Rachel, but I woke up with Leah. I don't care how good your marriage is. If you even dare try to tell me there's days you thought you were looking at Leah instead of Rachel, I will call you a liar. Because the fantasies of Dateland have nothing to do with the reality of marriage. Hardcore, biblical-based covenant with God till death do you part marriage. But the deal was... I wanted to use those two examples to get just a little further and talk about men for a moment. Again, I, to understand men and women for just a moment, how many notice that you women that you think different than men? We had men raising their hand right there. Let me give you an example. Men say, what you thinking about, honey? Oh, I'm th and you got a story. A woman just randomly looks over at her husband who's staring off into space. What are you thinking about? He said, nothing. And you go like, oh, now, I know you think about some. And you won't quit. Let me help you. He's really thinking about nothing. <laughs> there ain't nothing going on upstairs. 
But you push him so much, he'll make up something. And when he finally makes it up, it was the wrong answer. You're not off the hook yet. I'm going to just pry into man's Bible studies. Every man should study the Bible. The problem is there ain't but three scriptures he studies. One of them's in Ephesians. Women submit. And actually they don't study it. They just read the first three words. No need to read anymore. There's scripture that says, y'all, y'all hang with me because y'all, I mean, ladies are going to freak out when I read this because you think I'm equipping your man. If you can keep him here till I get done, he will walk out of here with a limp. If I, I promise you. <laughs> There's scripture that says that a woman should never, ever deny her husband his favorite sport. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Unless you agree on it for fasting. Number one, a man ain't going to fast because he only has two needs. One is for his favorite sport and the other is for his stomach full. And he can buy food at the restaurant. His wife is the only one on this planet that can meet any other need. I knew y'all get quiet. It was funny a while ago, wasn't it? Because women like, "Mm mm-mm-mm. And in that rare, rare occasion, it does tell the man not to deny his wife. But that don't ever happen, does it? I don't know why they put that in there. And not only that, it says when you get married, your spouse's body belongs to you. It's in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 7. Some of you are getting mad at me because now men got four scriptures to study instead of one. But I ain't done yet. Don't leave till I get done. And so we're there. Not only that, women want to talk it out. Come on, hang on. Can I get a witness? Men, does a lady like to talk it out? The rest of you men, we got other issues we're going to help you with. And I know personalities come into play here. But there's scripture in Proverbs that I don't understand. Matter of fact, Solomon, bless his heart, he had 300 wives and 700 concubines. He was really a sporty fellow. But there's a reoccurring theme in his Bible that he wrote. Four times. Let me read you some scripture that will help you understand. Man, you're going to be in my corner for a few minutes at least. And if you don't get some amens up in here, I don't know what to do for you. Hallelujah. Unless you're like that one kid, two kids on the playground. One of them comes up and says, my daddy can whoop your daddy. And that boy said, that ain't nothing. Mama whoops him all the time. (laughs) Better to dwell in a corner of a house than with a contentious woman. Proverbs 21.9. Proverbs 21.19. Better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious, angry woman. Again, in Proverbs 25, he says, better to dwell in the corner of a house than with a contentious woman. And just so, in case somebody didn't understand what he was talking about, in Proverbs uh, 27 and verse 15, he said, a continual dripping on a very rainy day and a contentious woman are a lot alike. I didn't hear one female voice in the building. You say he ought to listen. He ought to. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But you think you're explaining things. You think you're fixing him. You think you're figuring it out. In his mind, he hears drip, 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 drip. Matter of, fact, matter of fact, when he's got that blank stare on his face, there's just something up there going drip, drip. And you catch him off guard. He don't know what's coming. What you thinking? <laughs> Nothing. Liar. <laughs> come on. I, come, man, am I telling you the truth? Am I up here by myself? Is this my last Sunday at the river? <laughs> 
Women kept this church. They established this church. They kept the fire going. And I'm treading on dangerous ground. But my wife is teaching kids, so I'm okay. Praise God. <laughs> I try to get her out of there most Sundays. But I'm like, honey, go ahead and teach them kids this morning. But I'm trying to shine a light. Because men spend their whole life trying to explain how they feel and you're listening to the words and they ain't got no words to say nothing with they're trying everything they say is an accusation to you ladies when all they try and do is like this is what i feel let me show you a big difference between what you feel 